Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us on this webinar, Smart Giving with the Cambridge Community Foundation. A huge thank you to our sponsors, Cambridge Trust and Hemingway and Barnes for their ongoing partnership with the Cambridge Community Foundation and their generous support of this webinar. This event is hosted by the Cambridge Community Foundation's Professional Advisors Council, which is an active group of financial and legal professionals who bring essential technical knowledge to the foundation's philanthropic partnerships. You can see a list of our members and learn more about our work on the foundation's website. I want to acknowledge the PAC, that's the Professional Advisors Council, the PAC co-chairs, Kristen DiZallo, who joins us on our panel today, and Kelwin Conroy Newman, who is out there in our audience today. This event is hosted by the Cambridge, I'm sorry, I am Beth Milkovitz, a board officer and professional advisor council member. Um, and I'm also a relationship manager at Brown Brothers Harriman. And today I am the moderator for our discussion. Our three expert panelists whom you can see here are Jennifer Pline, Executive Vice President and Head of Wealth Management at Cambridge Trust. Jennifer is also a board member of the Cambridge Community Foundation and a special thanks to Jennifer for joining us on this PAC event. Kristen DiZallo, who I've mentioned already, is a partner at Rubin and Rudman, and she is co-chair of the PAC. And Wendy Weiss, a financial advisor and founder of Weiss Financial and a member of our Professional Advisors Council as well. Just a bit about the Cambridge Community Foundation. The Cambridge Community Foundation, or CCF as I like to call it, is Cambridge's local giving platform, built, funded, and guided by residents since 1916. The foundation's innovative and creative approach serves as a true asset to its donors, enabling individuals and families to achieve impact and derive meaning from their philanthropy in their lifetimes and beyond. Today, we're going to hear from our experts on different ways to think about smart giving with a community foundation as your partner. As I moderate this discussion, I'll also be offering some tangible examples of ways you may consider working with a community foundation at different junctures of philanthropic planning. So to start, I'm going to invite Jennifer Pline Again, Executive Vice President and Head of Wealth Management at Cambridge Trust and former Managing Director and Chief, Tr and Chief of Chief Trusts and Gifts Officer at Harvard Manager Management. And Jennifer will share from her experience, both her past philanthropic experience and current um, professional advisor experience to tell us a little bit about why people give, when they give, and what might be on their minds as they do. Jennifer. Thank you so much, Beth, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you to everybody who's joining today, including one of my colleagues at Cambridge Trust Foundation, who will remain nameless, but uh, Kristen and I both know him well. Um, you know, one of the things that I have always enjoyed about being in wealth management is the opportunity to guide clients on their philanthropic journey um, and helping them make a difference with their wealth. I think often people think about charitable giving as being sort of tax smart, and uh, that's the reason that, that you should give to charities. Um, but it's not really just about death and taxes, but really a way to make a difference in your lifetime. Um, as Beth said, I have spent many years really on both sides of the table, both um, as a donor, as a board member, and then in my work at Harvard Management. And I've had a chance to observe what families have done with their wealth and the impact that they've been able to build uh, with that wealth. So as I talk today, I'm gonna to really cover three things. One is to talk a little bit about when folks typically do their estate plans. Also, um, when they should think about re-evaluating those plans and then talking about why people do give and what, what does it actually do for them aside from the financial motives. And then I'll close with an example of a family that we worked with at Harvard Management. So turning to the first point, um, you know, the first estate plan is typically done when people are somewhere between ages 40 and 60. Um, you know, as an aside, I'll say that when I first, my husband and I did our first will, the attorney 
we worked with said, if it weren't for young babies and plane trips, she wouldn't have any business whatsoever. And uh, often people start that process when they have children and they have to think about things like trips and, and planning for their children for events that hopefully will never happen. But as people go through their lives, they do take the opportunity to reevaluate, uh, you know, when there's a life altering event, whether it's a divorce or remarriage, um, a death of a spouse or child, an inheritance, or even the need for specialized care um, for aging parents. And then typically, um, as people go into retirement and have spent a little time in retirement, they reevaluate their estate plan. And Kristen's going to spend more detailed time on this, but one thing I think is an advisor is it's really important to encourage clients to do these reevaluations more frequently than that. Um, and I think as a trusted advisor, we can prompt them to have these conversations and to think about how their plans might change. Recently, we worked with an 80 year old client um, and asked him about his estate plan and his will. And he said, I'm not really ready for that yet. Uh, maybe I'll think about it, you know, at some point in the future. And, you know, the net result of that is he actually did have a plan and the state of New Hampshire and the U.S. government will decide what his plan will be. So, you know, there is there is no putting this off. And, and certainly I think we, we as advisors can encourage people to do that. As I think about giving, there are really lots of different reasons that people do give, and as I said before, it, it's really not about taxes, um, but it's, I think it's, as advisors, it's important to understand what is their motivation? Is it they're, that they're grateful for an experience they had with a charity? Um, is it that they like to want to be recognized? Is it uh, for the impact that they can have with um, their gifts? Is it their a legacy that they're trying to establish. And I think the better we understand client, clients' motivations, the better off we are in terms of helping them meet their long-term objectives. And as I put on my hat of being a trustee on nonprofit boards, I think it's really important to understand what makes a donor tick. Because once you, again, understand that motivation, you can then present options that make a lot of sense for their particular situation. And then I think in, in kind of a funny, fuzzy way, um, how does establishing a gift make people feel? And, you know, to me, when I see clients um, making gifts and talking about what they think their legacy will be, that, that is what really sort of drives people from the heart. And, um, really understanding how they feel about making those gifts and how satisfied they can be is incredibly gratifying and, and heartwarming. We also see people start out making fairly small gifts in the beginning as they get to know an organization um, and then gradually increase their engagement and their gifts. And I think Planned giving can really um, allow folks to have an incredibly large impact on an organization. What I saw in my years at Harvard is that when people established their first planned gift, it was often larger than the sum total of all of their previous contributions to Harvard. So again, it's a way I think to really maximize your impact and, and certainly um, watch the benefit of uh, or what your funds allow the charity to do. I think also as advisors, it's important to bring people's families into the conversation. And I have an example of a family that we worked with at Harvard who did what I thought was just so interesting and fascinating and kind of fun to watch from the outside. So it's a couple who were in their 70s. Um, they had adult children and young grandchildren, and they set up a charitable lead trust, a, a CLAT. And that's a trust that pays income to the charity during the lifetime of the trust, and then the, the principal goes back to the donor or family. So what they did is they had an annual meeting with their children and young grandchildren, and they asked them to recommend how to spend 
those charitable funds each year. And their grandchildren were really quite young when they started the process, you know, in, in their, you know, younger than 10, seven, eight, nine years old. And so as they started the process, certainly the kids started to understand what charitable giving was and were able to think about what was important to them. But over time, as the kids got older, they were able to get more and more sophisticated about where they wanted to spend their money and the grandparents asked them to sort of you know make the case for why they wanted to give to that charity and they did it at thanksgiving which i think is a natural time for being grateful and and expressing your gratitude and so it became a real family tradition and i think you know those those children now are probably well into their 20s and my hope is that that family has really established their philosophy of what they can do with their wealth and what was important to them in terms of their giving. And I think, you know, as when we as advisors bring children, adult children into the conversation, it also helps us deepen our relationships and also really make relationships much stickier um, and allow us to serve our clients better. I think, you know, when I entered the financial world, I was sort of intrigued by all the numbers and the logic and the analysis. But when it really comes right down to it, um, in, wealth management, in wealth management, I think it's really about um, how we help our clients meet their objectives and how what's the emotional side of working with clients and being able to make those connections, I think um, is probably the most gratifying thing that any one of us do, aside from, you know, the investments and the numbers and, and all of that, uh, all of those things. So as I close, I just want to mention two resources um, that are available to all of us. And I have, I have a little prop here. So this is a book called Wealth and Families written by the late Charlie Collier at Harvard. And um, I give it to clients um, who are interested in talking about their legacy um, and the wealth that they have and ways to talk about it. Um, and then, of course, you're going to hear a little bit more later um, from Beth about the ways that the Cambridge Community Foundation can help. But the charities themselves have incredible resources, and we certainly encourage advisors to tap into all of those available resources as your clients are thinking about giving. So thank you uh, again for being here, and I will turn it back to Beth. Jennifer, thank you so much. That was really fa fantastic and excellent ideas. Um, the motivation and the chosen vehicle to be philanthropic is unique to every individual and family. And the Community Foundation is a hub for philanthropy that can foster this uniqueness by offering a range of giving opportunities to creatively meet donors where they are. And that's what you were saying, Jennifer, right? That the idea of using the foundation um, maybe even as a way to test out where you want to give, maybe to make connections to nonprofits that you can um, learn from or learn more about. Um, and one way that I really think a community foundation can work well for this is that a community foundation offers a way for donors to fill some gap funding. So community foundations themselves are grant makers, and they usually have more asks than they have assets to give. And one thing that's been incredible as I've worked with the Cambridge Community Foundation myself is the opportunity to, and to really look at the grants, the asks that have come in from all, all the amazing nonprofits in our community. Um, and they're broken out by area, service area. So whether it's housing or you know, children or economic stability, and it gives donors a way to say, well, I'm really interested in this um, field. Um, the Community Foundation has vetted this organization and is giving up to, you know, maybe there's a small gap, maybe it's a $2,000 gap, maybe it's a larger gap between what the organization needs and what the Community Foundation is giving. And donors are asked to fill those gaps if they feel so moved. And that's an amazing opportunity, I think, for so many of the things you talked about, Jennifer, trying out philanthropy in some way, 
gaining access to what's happening in your community, learning about sectors that you might not even know exist, or even combinations of things that you didn't realize were out there. So to me, that's a very a very useful, dynamic um, way that you can com- that you can partner with a community foundation in any stage of your philanthropy and as an individual, as a couple, as a larger family, perhaps. So thanks for those comments. That was, that was excellent. Um, next, I'd like to invite Kristen Dizalo to join into our conversation. Kristen is an experienced estate planner and she's going to share her thoughts on what makes for successful planning around smart charitable deductions year to year, as well as long-term philanthropic planning and what considerations go into legacy planning. Kristen. Thank you Beth so much and thank you everybody. It's so great to be here. Um, I have the wonderful opportunity with working with families on the estate planning side um, and I'm just really one piece of the puzzle. So I think the takeaway today with a lot of these conversations is it's not just one advisor who should be running this um, plan. The financial advisor is often the first step. That's where clients are engaged to talk about their finances every year. These topics typically come up. So if you're an advisor on the webinar, you may be the first stop, but do not ever feel like you're alone in that journey with clients. You may piece through what their high levels are, but then you're going to be working with their trust and estates attorney, maybe the accountant, and then a charity often gets pulled in for the discussions as well. And that's where a place like Cambridge Community Foundation can offer um, invaluable resources. And really it's all just about making you look good as the advisor, getting all of these connections in place. Um, And clients often have high level goals. They know kind of what they wanna do, but they really don't know how they wanna implement it. So there's a lot of considerations beyond just why they're motivated to give. That's really the first step because that's gonna get them to to wanna make that gift. Um, But then as the advisor, we want to make sure that the right property is used to make that gift. That doesn't have to just be cash or stock. That can be jewelry, uh, stamp collections, real estate, um, artwork, glassware, really anything that's of value um, can be used within that giving structure. And then we have to think about the tax um, implications because that is an important part. If someone has a large amount of wealth um, in the United States, the IRS will tax um, an estate uh, as of this year, if it's more than 12.06 million um, is our current estate and gift tax exemption. If you're living in a state like Massachusetts, that number is way, way lower and essentially zero if you have more than a million dollars in assets. Um, there's going to be a giant hit at your estate. So sometimes people are doing charitable planning as part of their estate plan for plan giving to reduce that charitable burden. Others want to make that gift during their lifetime um, to offset some gain on an asset or um, to help reduce income taxes. So it's, it's even though it might not be a motivator for a lot of families, it ends up being an important part of the conversation and understanding where best to make that gift from, especially on the estate planning side. Um, We utilize retirement accounts for giving because retirement accounts are income taxable, especially if it's not a Roth. Um, They're going to be income taxable to the recipient like kids when you pass away. And so they're a really nice vehicle. No longer do those children get the benefit of being able to stretch that income distribution out over their lifetime anymore. Um, So we can often use other types of charitable trusts. Jennifer mentioned the CLAT. love acronyms in the estate planning world. Um, So there's lots of different charitable trusts and uh, lead trusts where the income goes to charities during your life and then balance to other people. Uh, Remainder trusts, which is in the reverse. The income stream can go out to family members and then the balance goes to charity. And with those remainder trusts, you can kind of give your child an income stream for their lifetime and a remainder to charity. That topic in and of itself and a lot of these tax topics we could talk about for hours. Um, So um, we can always flush through any of these topics if people are interested in them. Um, But I would would say really thinking about this as the advisor, as a team approach. And I had one experience last year that was a great example of this. I had a a long-term client who had a piece of investment property in California in California. 
in uh, Orange County, and they had purchased the property, I think, for about two million, two and a half million dollars. And their plan was eventually to retire there. Before they were going to retire there, they had renters in the property, so they were getting a nice income stream. And they wanted this property either for their retirement or for one of their three kids once they grew up, if they wanted to reside in California to be able to live in. Um, you know, more than a decade goes by, they realize in life, none of the kids want to ever live in this property, which if you Zillow the property, I kept thinking to myself, how do you not want to live in this property? I mean, it's beautiful, uh, $6 million house in Southern California. None of the kids wanted anything to do with it. And the parents realized they were going to be kind of East Coasters. That's where their kids landed. And they really just didn't want to manage the property anymore and have this as a rental property. No longer needed it. But since they purchased it for two and a half million and it's now worth close to six million, there's a giant capital gains tax on that sale. They never resided in that property. There's absolutely no reduction, um, you know, any improvements. Um, so they were faced with this problem and this dilemma of, okay, we want to sell this property, we, but we kind of want to offset the tax. But beyond that, like, what are we going to do with this money? Um, and they felt like they really wanted to start thinking about charitable giving. Um, but the original, the original reaction of getting no more income from this property or not getting the proceeds from this car. Uh, this property started as a conversation of a little fear-based of like, oh, you know, we're getting tens of thousands of dollars a month right now, or there's going to be proceeds from the sale. Do we really want to part with all of it? So we started talking about charitable remainder trusts. Do you want an income stream to match not maybe not all of the investment income you're getting right now? And and I, you know, we we talked about the different options. And then I said, let's talk to your advisor. Let's put numbers here and not be coming from a place of fear. And after the discussion with their advisor, they said, you do not need this income stream. You do not need these net proceeds. We will run these models based on every recession point and you get getting cancer and having to have treatments for the next 35 years, and you will never, ever use all of your money. So what do you want to do with this? And then it turned out to be a fairly simple answer. They just decided to donate that entire property. They didn't sell it first. So they just, you know, donated the real estate. So they um, didn't experience any gain. And they, they, when they really thought about it, they said, we want to have an active participation in this charitable gift. If we're doing a remainder trust where we're getting an income for life, and then it's going to charity when we pass away, we're not involved in that. And we really, as becoming retired now, this is what we want our legacy to be. So it was a really lovely um, outcome because money was able to get into charitable hands much sooner. And it was actually the simplest answer. But clients aren't always ready to hear that right away. They really have to get through this. And that's where that advisor approach is so um, important to make sure that you're giving smartly. You're not just making a, you know, a decision where you're looking at one piece of that puzzle. Um, the financial piece, the trust and estates piece, the accounting piece, the, the community foundation piece all need to work together because clients um, also have the opportunity with uh, foundations like the community, uh, Cambridge Community Foundation to then also be able to work through where do we want this legacy to go? Like, do we just throw it in a DAF and not think about it um, in a donor advised one? Or do we make strategic giving and really figure out what we want to do? And just because a community foundation is located in a region like Cambridge, doesn't mean you have to gift to Cambridge. You're giving and you have a network of the entire United States to work within. So they're the you know, high touch place that the donor can go through. And sometimes you know, a donor advised fund is not way to go. It could be a field of interest fund or setting up a scholarship. And there's so many wonderful ways that you can maximize um, how you wanna give in the best way and really get that customized high touch service it's not just someone on the phone on a 1-800 number. I mean, these are people who will work with your clients and it doesn't have to be those $5 million gifts. This is smaller gifts that they have the ability to work with individuals to make their, their philanthropic dreams come true. So it's a wonderful partnership. Um, and so really the takeaway is you are not al in a alone in this and you shouldn't be You know, piecing through client goals, but then really working with their team to implement them can have um, really Really wonderful outcomes. Thank you. Kristen, thank you so much. Um, 
I love that example. I love that example because I feel like it touches on everything that we have talked about and will talk about um, next. And, and some of the things I really want to highlight, um, you did such a great job talking about the team. And I think we all think about team. Typically, we think about the estate planning attorney, the accountant, the investment advisor slash financial planner. Um, perhaps there's an insurance advisor in there. But I think there are other pieces to that, too. And one of them is philanthropic advisor. And, and a community foundation can really serve as that philanthropic advisor. And I think of it as this team, we may not all be working at the same firm, we're not <laughs> typically, but we are creating a team around that client. And as far as that client is concerned, you know, we are, we're working on the same team for them. Um, and so I think the, the community foundation is unique, as you pointed out, having such a deep knowledge of the local giving community, but also broader. Right. So as a community foundation of Cambridge, the Cambridge Community Foundation understands what's happening in and around the, the, the Cambridge community, Cambridge, some of Belmont, all the areas around us. Um, what's happening in Massachusetts generally. And then be, as a as a convener, as somebody who's understanding what's going on in the, in the landscape of our state and then nationally part of a national network of community foundations that are really tapping into each location, each region's expertise. And so I think that's something, you know, there's that that dichotomy. It's it's a local giving platform that is really tied into what's happening nationally around philanthropy and can really play a part in that team in terms of coming up with strategies. So as you mentioned in the case you talked about, the simplest answer ended up being the best one. And, and I think that's a key of being part of a team. If you're doing this in a silo and you just take the client's word for it, you may have drafted a clat or a crut or, you know, and, and the community foundation can help you with that. But by working as a team, it ended up being really a basic donation um, that was the best for this family. If it is something more complicated, that is something that a community foundation can help with and also can sort of be a layer to support a nonprofit that maybe isn't large enough for those more complex gifts. So I think that's also something to highlight, a real important, you know, the perspective of the community foundation as part of the team. I was also thinking back to Jennifer's story about the man in his 80s who just wasn't ready to talk about that. I think we all face this as advisors around, you know, communication, both with, with the individual around what their needs and wants are, and then further with the family is so important to the work that we do. The technical work we can do all day, if we set it up and it's not communicated properly or the client's not on board, then it doesn't matter. None of it matters. And, um, and I think part of our job is getting over the humps of, you did such a great job with that, Kristen. What is the fear that is holding back this family from, from making the next step in terms of you know, making this philanthropic gift? And it was that they were not going to have enough money. And then the rest of the team said, no, yeah, you are. <laughs> you are going to have enough money. And it allowed them, it freed them to, to do something during their lifetime that they felt really good about and knew was part of their legacy moving forward. And, and that's key as well. So I feel like this ties really well into what Wendy is going to talk with us about in terms of how do you think about talking about that, that legacy with the family? right right now and how do we get to that point where we're communicating together with our clients um, with our clients other advisors to to create a plan that can be so meaningful during someone's life um, and Wendy I'm inviting you to join our our conversation now an experienced financial advisor founder of voice financial advisors and a formal financial advisor for Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch, who has been really focused on working with families. And I, I look forward to your comments. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I wanna start with one of the things that Jennifer said, that at certain points in people's lives, after they've developed their first estate plan, they may be at a point where they wanna to start to think about how they're gonna use their money differently. What's it going to do for them? Especially as Jennifer said, when they retire, when they inherit money, Maybe they have a second house to sell, et cetera, et cetera. And, and um, I think you might, that's a time that you might want to talk to your clients and help guide them if they're, if they're charitably inclined to create a, a, a charitable legacy. Um, so ask them if they might be interested in this. And leaving aside whether they use a plat or any of those particular entities, certainly a DAF is a nice easy one to work with, um, start to see 
if they can, if they're happy with this idea of developing something so meaningful and so important to themselves. You're, if you're, if you introduce the idea of creating a charitable legacy, your client's going to say, "Well, how could I do that?" And you can tell your client that it's rather, rather quite simple. It's a lot like building any tradition, except this one focuses on helping, sharing, and giving to have an impact, as we said earlier on, on something that your client and her, her grandkids might really feel is significant, like climate change. Like a tradition, it should engage every member of the family or at least the grandkids in a wonderful manner at least once a year. Thanksgiving sounds like a wonderful time. You're talking about being grateful. So I think I really like the example that Jennifer used. Um, you need, to, when you're working with children, you need to engage them and ask them questions that will help them to start to think. After all, you're developing a, a, a plan that you hope they can contribute to over a number of years, and you hope they can learn over, over a period of time. Um, so you want to talk, you want to ask them questions, you want to listen, you want to work on little projects with them, you're going to get them ready to make to think about sharing something that they have to have an impact. Um, um, tell your client, so besides having these uh, sort of learning, uh, learning agendas, your client might want to think of something else that she, she or he should engage them, each child in an age appropriate manner. So little children, ages five to 10 or 12, uh, think a lot about fairness, you know, and, um, and children who are adolescents have a slightly different focus. They start to think about difference. They think about inequality and privilege and fitting in. Remind your clients that children are very wealthy parents and grandparents, especially teens, might be embarrassed about their wealth and privilege. So your client can help this child work through the issue um, by explaining that the family uh, uh, charitable plan, and I'm hoping that I'm thinking in terms of a DAF, the family DAF and the family's tradition of giving, which they've been developing through discussions and learning sessions and the process, that 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 is actively working to reduce inequality, to open privilege to others by breaking down barriers. And that charity is a solution to this problem and so many others that you're, and so you can help, your client can help a grandchild be part of a solution um, through the family DAF and its legacy. Um, now, once your children have, once once the client has worked with the children at least a year, you can probably convene them to have them uh, make some decisions about what issues they want to address. And um, she may not know, but that's when grandma and grandpa can turn to the specialists at Cambridge Community Foundation. And as Beth has pointed out, um, it it it's a the foundation is extraordinarily knowledgeable about the needs of the community. Um, and how that how national issues are reflected um, in in local settings, they know which nonprofits address key issues and serve different target populations, and they're ready to reward your client by sitting down and talking to them with their children and grandchildren about the issues they want to focus on this particular year. So the staff can sit down and. Um, listen and then make a series of suggestions about the programs that the children could um, could fund. So I think this is a really, uh, so my, my, my suggestions are, are kind of short, but I do think it's important to help your client uh, work with her family. And I'm speaking as if the, the agent here is a woman, because I think very often, when families talk about wealth, very often it's it's a man, especially a man who's built the wealth, who is primarily engaged and feels more responsible, et cetera. And the partner, his partner may not feel so engaged. I actually think that 
working that developing a charitable legacy with the family, especially with the grant, the children and grandchildren, can engage her more clearly in this process, get her involved in 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 thinking about the wealth and how it could be used and 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 working with the children about in that way. So thank you very much. Wendy, thank you so much. I um you gave me so much to think about. I think it, it, it's just an excellent point that are relevant to think about as we segue into the Q&A section. And I just wanna note for all of our participants that there is a Q&A box at the top of your screen. And so please, if you have any questions about anything that we've talked about thus far, or anything that has, you know, that you're curious about with a client situation you have right now, please do use the Q&A section um, chat box to let us know. But Wendy, a few things that I just wanted to, to hold up with your last point about engaging people who may not be as engaged in these conversations around wealth. And I think that's really important. And using philanthropy as a way to engage less engaged folks. And that could be women who historically have not been as engaged in the typical financial conversations that we've had. It could be children who, you know, this can be a real tool to use to introduce children to wealth, potentially, to introduce children maybe to the responsibilities that come along with wealth um, along with the fun stuff <laughs> and the responsibilities could be fun too. But I think, you know, like as an entryway, as a, as a, you know, a way to start the conversations where people often don't know how to start these conversations and also to bring everyone around the table and hear, um, hear from everybody. And, and often, you know, younger generations typically haven't been as, um, as listened to maybe as, as they, are being now and maybe should be. And this is an area that would be really important um, to start early. As we said, if you have all the technical pieces in place and nobody understands why and people are upset about it um, or worse, didn't know about it and it's a surprise when somebody does die, that is, that's true disaster. That's when things you know really go poorly. Um, and so to start even as a way to communicate as a family using philanthropy is, is very important. Um, I think that thinking about the situations where community foundations can come in and be part of those conversations to capture the philanthropic intentions. And I love this, to safeguard the flexibility in the fund in instrument to accommodate the future, right? So as we know, there may be a, a matriarch and a patriarch who are, you know, this is what, this is their foundation or their DAF that they have set up, but their ideas, what's going on in the world, that changes. And so how do we build in the flexibility needed for future generations? And community foundations are, have been doing that for years. They're, they're um, a great partner when it comes to that conversation. One example that recently happened at the Cambridge Community Foundation was a family coming to the CCF with an advisor and they really thought they were going to set up a donor advised fund, which I think everybody knows um, is a fund that you, do, you create this fund um, you advise on it so you can say where the grants go. Uh, and, and so it's your own charitable vehicle, but it's rolled up underneath the community foundation. So you have a lot of privacy around it. There's a lot of flexibility. You can involve family members, et cetera. And, and the foundation will help you with consulting on, on maybe if you want some ideas of where to grant. Through the conversation, it became clear to the Cambridge Community Foundation that a field of interest fund may better fit this family. A field of interest fund is a little bit different. So rather than your own family's donor advised fund, this is a, a fund that many donors that you may not know donate to around a specific area. So maybe it's economic stability, maybe it's the arts, maybe it's education. So you have feel very passionate about that. And there's more flexibility built into that type of fund because a community foundation can actually make grants directly to individuals or to organizations that aren't necessarily qualified organizations, where with a donor advised fund, you must make grants out to only qualified nonprofit organizations. You, you can't make donations to, um, to an individual from your donor advised fund. And that's what this family was really interested in, is how do we get money into the hands of people who need it, individuals who need it? And that, that was not going to be able um, to be accomplished through a DAF. Um, so if it weren't for the conversation with the community foundation, and, and it does lead to flexibility down the road as well. So, you know, that maybe that 
um, that family works, continues to work with the community foundation and down the road does open a DAF later, um, or and that contributes to the field of interest fund and to other nonprofits that they're involved in. There's so many possibilities, but that was a, an interesting um, twist on what normally happens when some when a family goes to a community foundation. Um, and, and the other thing too, is there's some more flexibility because you are donating it's, it's not a donor advice fund. So the qualified charitable distribution also can go to a field of interest fund. So to pull what Kristen was talking about, more, you know, legacy planning, technical issues, um, there's, there's some flexibility around that as well. And I think that's not as well known. We all think about, I think I do, charity, charitable giving to qualified nonprofit organizations. But as philanthropy changes and people's objectives change and, and lines blur, um, I think that the flexibility that a community foundation offers and the um, solutions that they can provide are going to become even more relevant than they have been already. Um, so I want to thank each of our panelists, but, but they're not going anywhere because we do have some questions for everyone. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, and I think what we've covered here is very typical in an advisor world, which is that we're looking at, you know, technically from a tax perspective, potentially, um, how, how do we give advice to this family? And then, but also really importantly, bringing in that other piece, that, that the piece about how they communicate as a family, how are their values man manifested in what they're doing? How can we help facilitate communication across generations? How can we start really difficult conversations? Um, and, and I think that a community foundation can be a great partner in that. So to kick us off, Jennifer, I'm gonna come to you first. Um, and the first question that we have is, how do wealth managers engage with philanthropy and, and maybe go a little deeper into how to separate the meaning from, from that transactional piece. And I think sometimes our clients are expecting the transactional piece only. So how do you, how do you create that conversation? Yeah, thanks, that's a great question. And I think the, the first thing is to really sit with the client and family and have a pretty deep conversation around, first, what is it that, what, what are you wanting to do? What, what sort of, you know, what's in your heart that's driving you towards um, making um, some kind of charitable uh, contribution and to truly understand um, what they're interested in and what kind of impact they want to have, because that's really going to drive then the vehicle that you use. And um, I think um, all of us have given these examples of how people have used certain vehicles to um, accommodate the, the kind of gift that they're trying to make, but really trying to tease the two things out, the two things away from each other and letting the structure follow the desire for uh, what the family is trying to do. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. That's excellent. Um, another question that has come up, and I'm going to I'm going to sort of let anybody who wants to answer this. It's about impact investing. And I think, I think it's about, you know, those blurred lines that I mentioned. Right. And so it, and maybe it wasn't ever as, you know, the, his, the past always looks crystal clear when we look back, I'm sure there were blurred lines all over the place, but if we think about, you know, you had your, the money, this is the money that I give away and I get a charitable de de um, deduction for it. And, and then this is the money that I am putting in the market and that I want to leave in there for long term and, and make a return on and that I will, you know, leave this money to my family and I'm giving this money away. Um, those lines seem to be blurring with this idea of impact investing. And I don't know if anybody on, even, you can wave at me right now, if you'd like to take this question on, you know, thinking about impact investing as a form of philanthropy potentially, or is it an, in, is it investment with a silver lining? Is it, actually the way philanthropy is going. Do we have any thoughts on that? I think this is a, and I, yeah, Jennifer. Yeah, I, I can certainly jump in here. I, I think, um, you know, it's interesting. Um, often I think as, um, as investment professionals, we often um, tend to think of 
um, charitable giving in a way as a, an investment. Um, and we're not looking for the same kind of return uh, from that investment that we would be if we're buying a stock or a bond. Um, but I, I do think there are ways to sort of bring that, um, the investment piece and the charitable piece together in an investment portfolio through impact investing. There are lots of different um, kinds of investments that can be made that actually do have a, a charitable component or, you know, an underlying charitable component um, and also can be used as a way to um, kind of over time help change the world. Um, and, you know, there are certainly um, green investments that can be made there. I've seen um, different fixed income um, investments that actually pay a return based on how the how the uh, particular um, what I want to say how, what what the not the financial results but the impact results are um, you know what's the recidivism rate in in investing in people um, who are coming out of uh, being incarcerated so I think those those things are going to gradually sort of come together uh, over time and. What I really like is, you know, in the time that I've been in the investment world is to really um, watch how people care much more about the impact their investments have. It's not just about making money, but it's also about doing good things over time. Beth, can I say something? Yes, please, Wendy. I think I, I, you're right that people are really looking for impact and they're very concerned about ESG issues. Uh, in the US, we've had some ESG funds. In Europe, they have what they call green bonds. They're just starting to develop them, but they're investments in projects that will help improve the climate. Um, I have seen work on it, but I haven't seen much um, paperwork that I, for, for Americans to, to look at. So I don't actually know what we're investing in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think that may be the future, especially as bonds actually produce a slightly higher interest rate, which according to the Fed as of yesterday, yes, they will. So um, I think there is a future in that. And that is an interesting point about lines blurring and using those to and using those investments to charity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both, Wendy and Jennifer. And I, and I agree. I think, I think that is um, the future. And thank you for asking that question, Eric. We really appreciate that. Um, I have a question for you, Kristen. Um, which is going back a little bit to this idea of, you know, using maybe philanthropy as a way to start a difficult conversation. So you do this all the time where you um, have conversations with people about their death, their impending death and, um, and, and their and disability. Lovely, it's lovely, and, <laughs> lovely topics all the time. I'd love to hear more about, you know, how do you start these conversations? Does philanthropy play a part in the, in that with for you? Yeah, I, philanthropy is one of all of the, the questions. You know, we want to make sure, I want to know if someone has a DAF and what their finances are and what their goals are with charitable goals and giving what their current giving is. But as Jennifer pointed out, sometimes people make small lifetime gifts and then their planned gifts is, is where they really um, try to make an impact. But I've noticed a shift a bit that people want to start realizing that and seeing that now and and that's inheritance in general. Why wait? Why wait to die to give your kids money? Why not see the impact you have now with grandkids? Um, so I think it's important when anyone's talking about it, especially the advisor, because you're not you're talking about lifetime and then what they're going to pass on. But it's not so framed as death or disability. I'm like the gloomy cloud coming in, talking about you know if you're going to you know become disabled and everybody's going to pass away. So talking about death and that that conversation can be very fearful for certain clients. And sometimes, you know, if it's a couple, the one partner is, you know, pushing the conversation, the other one just sits back and is fairly silent because these are very upsetting things to talk about. If you just lost a loved one, it's upsetting to talk about. So I try to 
be light. And I do probably make way too many jokes sometimes and have levity to it because I don't want them to think about their death and disability. That's not what it's about. It's thinking about their lifetime and their relationships and what's important to them and their legacy that they want to leave. And I try to say, don't think about the event. Think about everything up to the event or think about what you want for your kids and whether you're here or not. Um, so there are they are hard conversations and bringing your kids into that conversation. Sometimes people are a little hesitant to do, but I really encourage them, get the kids involved now. Now, when they're 20, are you going to tell them you have $30 million? Probably not because you don't need them to know those details necessarily. Sometimes people say, yes, I was kept out of finances. I want my kids to know every single detail. Um, so there is, you know, what your kids can handle. It's so personal to that. Um, but I do family meetings with the clients and, and their kids. I want them to understand, especially once they're in a fiduciary role, what is their responsibility? But before that, you know, the speaking to the why, which we've all talked to, why did they set it up this way? And I often ask, ask clients when I look at their plans, if they have existing plans, they'll do like 25 at a uh, third at 25 and half at 40 and all at 55. And I'm like, why did you do that? <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess I just, they told me like people don't know why they do things sometimes. Um, so you really, uh, as uncomfortable as it can be, I find once you just start talking about it, it becomes so much easier. You just got to get over the hump. And as before, a lot of it is fear-based of like not wanting to discuss these things. And why not? Why, why, why? Always ask the why if the client is doing something or doesn't want to do something because you can, you can really help them through that. Um, so I probably didn't directly answer your question, but um, trying to keep it light and, and really get them involved. And that's where philanthropy is good because it's it's not so scary as a topic. Right. Yeah, I'd, I'd add to that, Kristen. I think that's such a great um, answer and, and thought. And, you know, if, if, if families think that their adult kids or their grandchildren don't understand that they have wealth, they're, they're kind of kidding themselves because, you know, young people are pretty smart and they can figure it out from, even if you're not ostentatious about things, they understand, you know, you live in a nice house in a nice community, you get to go on nice vacations. So I think often um, just having, starting that conversation, like the first couple of sentences, well, you probably figure it out that we're really fortunate to have enough to live nicely on. But here's what really matters to us. It's, you know, it's giving back, it's being a family and making good decisions. And, and then you don't have to talk about the dollars, the exact dollars. And we as New Englanders tend to be really, um, you know, hesitant to, to talk about money in general. So we have to get over that. But I think talking about the meaning of money and what it allows you to do rather than the specific amount can be really, really helpful. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you all. I mean, I think this has been a wonderful session. Um, we've, we've covered a lot in this one um, webinar, and I think that we've identified potentially a few topics for future webinars, such as, you know, impact investing, um, communication around fam with families, also the giving now, I think the environment that we have just lived through, um, I think we were probably moving towards this, but so many foundations are spending it all out now. You know, the need is now. Um, it really interesting conversations happening around that, which I think also tie into impact investing. So today we covered, you know, the idea of transaction, um, which is important and integral to the work of an advisor, but how, having part of the team, um, a philanthropic advisor, such as somebody from a community foundation, to make sure that we are also having those deeper conversations, the whys and the, you know, how do we engage everyone who's sitting around this table with us? Um, I think that, you know, that was a really key point for today. And I appreciate each of you, Wendy, Kristen, and Jennifer for leading us through that conversation. Thank you to everybody who has uh, participated today and attended. We want to thank our generous sponsors, Cambridge Trust and Hemingway and Barnes for their support of the foundation 
And I want to remind everyone, keep an eye out in your inbox because um, we will be reaching out um, with other resources, webinars, ideas. This is the Professional Advisor Council at the Cambridge Community Foundation pulling together um, ideas for other professional advisors, right? How do we work together? How do we work as a team with a foundation? Um, and so please be on the lookout. And if you have any questions beyond here, um, because our time is ending, I'm just gonna check. Yeah, we have, we're, we're getting out five minutes early, amazing. Um, you can email at info at cambridgecf.org. So that's info at cambridgecf, as in communityfoundation.org. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you to the Cambridge Community Foundation for being such a great team member and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Beth. Thank you, everybody.